What is the fourth dimension? Ask Albert Einstein, the German mathematician. Ask Peter Demianovich Uspensky, the Russian philosopher. Ask J.B. Priestley, the English playwright. Ask Salvador Dali, the Spanish painter. Ask Paul, the apostle in the New Testament. What is the fourth dimension? What is length? What is one dimension? Where is length? What is width? What is a second dimension? Where is width? What is length and width? What is a two-dimensional thing? What is area? What is height? What is a third dimension? Where is height? What is length and width and height? What is a three-dimensional space? What is volume? What is a fourth dimension? Where is a fourth dimension? What is a four-dimensional space? Where is a four-dimensional space? But these are not the direction of the fourth dimension or of four-dimensional space. These are only the extensions of our ordinary three dimensions. Even the artificial satellites and the artificial planets and the astronauts move in three-dimensional space. Although their motion and their experiences might be considered four-dimensional in the space-time sense, which we'll discuss next week. But to return to our study of dimension, now with the help of motion, consider length. The first dimension, tracing by a moving point is possible. Consider width, the second dimension, tracing by a moving point is possible. Height, the third dimension, again tracing by a moving point is possible. Now the fourth dimension, tracing by a moving point seems impossible. The point must not move in our three directions of right and left, forward and back, up and down. What is the length of a human being? What is the width of a human being? What is the height of a human being? What is the fourth dimension of a human being? To study these questions, I have chosen four interpretations of the fourth dimension. The pure mathematical, the spatial for today, and for the second talk, the temporal and the metaphysical. Right at the beginning, I would like to insist on a point of rigor to show that I'm acquainted with the new mathematics. It's important to distinguish between a dimension and a space, that is, between the fourth dimension and a four-dimensional universe. Uh, secondly, I'd like to issue two warnings. Don't let the models and the ideas I present become mere curious gimmicks. They are to help you to a higher level of understanding. And understand that in two half-hour talks, it is possible only to touch the subject, to stimulate your imagination, and to lead you on in search of the miraculous. The mathematical interpretation. Consider this series of powers of x. It goes on to infinity. x could be considered as the length of a one-dimensional unit. x squared as the area of two dimensions. x cubed as the volume of a cube in three dimensions. x to the fourth. Uh, but we are stopped here. Why can't we go on to x to the fourth? Is it that our universe is limited to three dimensions, or is this just a limitation of our senses? This I call the sense barrier. 
Looking back here, you see that the line, the first and lower space, is included in the higher. Then the line with the square is carried on into the cube and basic to the cube. And the cube itself, carrying on with it, the line and the square, is basic to the higher dimensional form, the four-dimensional cube, hypercube, or tesseract. And yet, we cannot reach it. It is invisible to us. What is this sense barrier? Consider these quadratic equations. x squared equals 1. That's one variable, one dimension, one axis. There would be two points, a positive one and a negative one. x squared plus y squared equals 1. A circle, two variables, two dimensions. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. A sphere in three dimensions. x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus a squared equals 1. That would represent, but again, we are stopped. Our senses go no farther. The mathematics continues, but we can't visualize it. Once again, the sense barrier. Would you notice that the two points in the original space are included in the higher space, and the circle is basic to the, to the sphere, and the sphere would be basic to the hypersphere. In this section, you see that mathematics leads us on beyond the number 3 into the numbers 4 and 5, but there is this sense barrier and the invisibility. Is it possible that we can transcend this sense barrier? Ah, but that would be the metaphysical section. Now we consider the spatial. You see the spatial section is divided into a number of headings. We will start with the building up of higher spaces, first by dimensions. Here is a one-dimensional unit. Here is a second, a third, and a fourth. Now, you will object that they are not one-dimensional. They are three-dimensional because there's a slight extension in width and thickness. It's true. I have another set which are purely one-dimensional. Here they are. But you see that they are invisible. I use them only for lecturing to principals and inspectors. Today, we will stick to these visible ones. We take one unit, and to it we add a second at right angles. Not necessary to have a right angle, but that's a popular angle. We take the third dimension, add it at the same point in a direction not contained in the original two space, forming three mutually perpendicular straight lines. The fourth dimension, quite a simple matter. Insert it at, again at the central point, and it will go in a direction at right angles to these original three. But just a moment, you see that that is not perpendicular. Those angles are acute angles. What is the direction of this fourth dimension? Well, you remember that we talked about it when we studied the corner of the room in the first part of the lecture. We talked about it again, explaining that it was not extensions of our ordinary three dimensions. And I suggest that you examine now the corner in the room in which you are. There the three dimensions come together, and the fourth dimension starts from there, but not up or out, but in a direction not contained in our three-dimensional world. The second section is by folding and unfolding. Uh, here again we have four one-dimensional units, but this time they're linked into a chain. Uh, this defines a universe stretching to a positive infinity here, negative infinity here. And if you're Einsteinian, space is curved, and the two infinities, of course, are one on the uh, great circle stretching below. To build up higher space, we fold. Now, the central one remains in its original space, but the others, you see, move up into higher space and, in fact, become invisible to the original one-dimensional space. Notice that as they move, the hinges are zero-dimensional, that there is no distortion, and that this extra one folds over the top and completes the figure, forming the two-dimensional unit, the square. Uh, you've heard of Kipling, who said that uh, east is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, and certainly in one-dimensional universe that is true, but in higher space. Or it has been said that this could be considered the moment of birth, and this the moment of death, and this your lifeline. Here at the quarter section is about where most of you are. 
in one dimensional idea, of course, birth and death are separated by the line of life. But if we consider higher space, now step this up a dimension. We have a square bounded by squares and an extra. This apparatus exists in a two-dimensional universe going to positive infinity, negative infinity, positive infinity, negative infinity, or if you're Einsteinian, it is the surface or part of the surface of a great sphere. We perform the folding again, and I suggest that you follow the laws of folding here because we're going to build up higher spaces by analogy. The hinge is one dimension less. So the two-dimensional objects move on one-dimensional hinges. You'll notice that the units are moving out of their original space into higher space, and therefore they've become invisible to the lower space. You'll notice that there is no distortion of the units, and that the last one comes over forming a lid, and that all the extremities are linked together. And we form the three-dimensional unit, the cube. I think of this every time I go into a pastry shop to buy a cake. Notice how the girl flips that two-dimensional thing up into a three-dimensional thing. Uh, once I couldn't contain myself, and I said, do you know what you're doing? She said, what? I said, you're investigating the fourth dimension. And she called the manager. Notice that this can be unfolded, and a cube unfolded in our space becomes this form as the cake box unfolded takes its two-dimensional form. Now we step this up a higher dimension. We have a central cube bounded by cubes with an extra. To fold this figure and form the four-dimensional tesseract, it would be necessary to obo uh, obey the folding rules established here and the central cube will be the only one that will remain in our space. The hinge, hinges will be two-dimensional, and this is a fantastic concept, that this cube will rotate on this square without distortion. And this side will come in contact with this, this with this, this with this. So that if I should fold it, all cubes would disappear from our space into invisibility, into the four-dimensional space, except the central one. And this would form a lid enclosing the whole thing in a magnificent three-dimensional symmetrical, four-dimensional symmetrical object, the tesseract. Before I leave this, you will notice that the lower spaces are contained in the higher. The linkage of one-dimensionals is here and here. The linkage of one-dimensionals is here and here. The linkage of squares is contained in this one as well. So the lower spaces are carried on into the higher. We can perform this same operation with blocks. Here is the central block. We put a block on the left, one on the right, one in front, one behind, one above, one below, and the extra. Again, we have a tesseract, a four-dimensional unit, unfolded into lower space. To me, it's always fantastic that Salvador Dali, in painting one of his famous crucifixions, crucifixion hypercube, chose as the cross this tesseract unfolded in our three dimensions. What a fine symbol of a higher truth, a truth of a higher universe unfolded for a lower universe. You'll notice also that Dali has cleverly put in the floor here by means of tiles, square tiles, the two-dimensional form and the cracks form even the one-dimensional chain. Now we investigate the fourth dimension by projection and its reverse. Here is a deck of cards. This is three-dimensional. But if they're scattered, then they exist in two dimensions. Similarly, 
A cube, when projected in two dimensions, takes this form. And if it be reversed, then it forms a cube in three dimensions, just as the cards returned form a three-dimensional pack. If you examine this form, you will see that it is a square within a square with the corners joined. This is the projection in two dimensions of a cube. Now, by analogy, if you want a tesseract projected in three dimensions, you would have a cube within a cube and the edges joined. And that is this figure. If I wish to form the cube by the opposite of projection, I take the inner square and move it its own length in a direction not contained in the original. Similarly, if I wish to form the tesseract by the opposite of projection, I would take the inner cube and move it its own length in a direction not contained in our space, not up, down, forward, or back, right, or left. Again, this gives an idea of the fantastic quality of higher space. So that this is a tesseract projected vertically and in perspective in lower space, as this is the projection of a cube. If you're more artistic and prefer an oblique projection, then a cube projected obliquely into two dimensions would give this form. That is, a square, linked corners with a square, and the edges joined. Step that up a dimension, and you have a cube, linked corners with a cube. So that this is a projection obliquely in our space of a tesseract, this is a projection vertically with pro in perspective, and these are the unfolding of a tesseract in our space. So we have these three ways of making the acquaintance of this four-dimensional figure. For those of you who are statistically minded, we can find the properties of a tesseract in the same manner as we could find from this projection of a cube the properties of a cube. If you imagine the square within the square, the projection of a cube, you will find that the cube has three dimensions, six borders, eight corners, 12 edges, six surfaces, and just one cube. Uh, by analogy, to study this projection in perspective of the tesseract in our three-dimensional world, uh, you can count the number of corners. Try it. The cube, the outer cube, has eight. The inner cube has eight, a total of 16. The tesseract, four dimensions, 16 corners. How many edges has it? The outer cube has 12. The inner cube, 12, 24. But don't forget these four shortened oblique corners here, of which there are eight, a total of 32. The number of surfaces you can calculate in the same manner, 24. And there are eight cubes. Eight cubes? You only see two? No. Here is another cube, which is flattened here. And there are six similar ones, so there are eight cubes. Eight cubes enclose a tesseract. There's an interesting vertical relationship here that the dimensions form an AP, the series of natural numbers, with a general term of n. The borders, an AP, with a common difference of 2 and a general term of 2n whereas the corners form powers of two. That is a geometric progression with a general term of 2n. Our fourth method of studying the tesseract is by motion. Uh, consider the point of my finger as a no-dimensional unit. If I move it outside of itself, it traces out a one-dimensional unit a line like the bottom of this blind. If you consider the bottom of the blind as a one-dimensional unit and move it not in its own universe, which would be this way, but at right angles to it or outside of it, it traces a square, a two-dimensional unit. If you move a square, say the front of this filing cabinet, in a direction not contained in itself, it traces out a cube, the three-dimensional unit. And the cube, if moved in a direction outside itself, that is not up or down, right or left, forward or back, would trace out the four-dimensional object 
the Tesseract. So now we have a summary of the building up of higher spaces and we go on to the people of higher dimensions. The people of spaces makes a very interesting study of the fourth dimension. One dimensional creatures would be quite simple. Uh, the sap in a tree, uh, the mercury in a thermometer, or a worm in its hole. Uh, two dimensional people are much more interesting because by analogy, studying the relationship between two dimensional people and three dimensional people, we can project ourselves from three dimensions into four. What would a two dimensional person be like, a two dimensional man? He would have length and width, but no thickness. Here is a two dimensional man. He has length and width, he has a bit of thickness, but that's so he's visible. Here's another one with length and width and no thickness and he is invisible. I will explain uh, in the next lecture that you also have an extension in the higher dimension. Uh, this man has a skin which is just a line around the outside of him. His eye would be a slit in the edge of his skin. He would see only in his two-dimensional universe at the moment in this vertical plane. He could see in that direction, or if you turn him over like this, he could see backwards, but he cannot see out or in. I could turn him like this, and the slit of his vision would sweep across you people out there, and he would see just a moving slit of you, which would be an astonishing experience. Suppose our man comes home from work, he enters his two-dimensional house through the one-dimensional door with its zero-dimensional hinge. He settles down inside for comfort. He feels in complete privacy because he is completely enclosed. He looks up into the corner and there the dimensions come together airtight and watertight. He feels in complete privacy. And yet to our vision, he is completely exposed. His whole room is visible to us from higher space. Similarly, you think as you sit in your room there and look up at the corner that the three dimensions come together and give you complete privacy. But it's not true. This room is as wide open to the higher dimension as this man's room is open to our third dimensional space. I don't know how many dimensions you permit your God, but if you should allow him four dimensions, then he would be able to look into your room, whether all the doors and windows were shut or not, and see you, and see you above, below, behind, and all through the way we can see all the inner organs of this man. He would be able to see all the walls and the ceiling simultaneous, simultaneously of your room and through your room. He would be able to see all the rooms in all the world on both sides of the globe, simultaneously and instantaneously. Suppose we consider him in a horizontal plane. A friend of his comes to visit him, and as they see each other, this man can see only the front of this man, and they will have to change like this before they see the other side. And yet, there could be another man in a space just a hair's breadth above him, another two-dimensional world. And the man in the, in the two-dimensional world just above him and parallel to it would be closer to this man than his friend beside him in the same space. Suppose uh, this man believes in ghosts and he wants to get a ghost into his room. It's very simple. The ghost comes along like this, gives me the signal. I raise him a hair's breadth in higher space, slide him across. He drops in. He has arrived without passing through the walls. There are many interesting things in Flatland. Uh, take the rubber jar ring. Suppose this man wants to turn the rubber jar ring inside out. He would have to cut it and then turn it back on itself like this. However, a three-dimensional person could take a rubber jar ring and without cutting it, roll it on itself in the third dimension and turn it inside out. Similarly, by analogy, I have a tennis ball here. I can turn it inside out only by cutting a hole in it and turning it inside out in this manner. But a four-dimensional person could take the tennis ball without cutting a hole in it, turn it on itself in the fourth dimension, and it would be inside out. How pleasant that would be to take a uh, hen's egg roll it over in the fourth dimension. It would come out with the yolk on the outside and then the white 
and a shell in a nice little kernel in the center, and you could eat it like an apple. Uh, similarly, the two-dimensional man could pour water into this rubber jar ring and seal it up. It would be watertight. But we could take a number of rubber jar rings and pile them up in our third-dimensional direction and form a hose, which, of course, would not be invisible in the lower space, and squirt water through. By analogy, a four-dimensional person could take these tennis balls and put them in a pile and squirt water through them, four-dimensional water. Suppose our poor man has a bad toothache, he calls in a two-dimensional dentist, and the dentist would have to prop his mouth open and do the work. But if he knew a three-dimensional dentist, the three-dimensional dentist coming in from higher space could let the man stay there with his mouth shut and deal with the tooth however necessary. Similarly, if we had four-dimensional dentists, we could have our tooth work done with our mouths comfortably closed. There are many interesting things about two-dimensional people called flatland in their universe, but I want to add one more thing before the end of this talk, and that is the question of symmetry, which belongs in a lecture on the fourth dimension. Uh, our hands are symmetrical, for example. They fit like this, like this. One is the mirror image of the other. But let's take geometry. Here is a triangle, which is two-dimensional. If I want its symmetrical image, I would have to unhitch it and swing it down below. It would become its mirror image. But in higher space, I could just turn it like that and becomes its own mirror image without detaching or distorting. Similarly, a tetrahedron in three dimensions can be turned into its own mirror image by unhooking it and swinging it down below like that, and it would fit like that, its own mirror image. But in higher space, I could just turn it over, and without distortion or unhitching, it would become its own mirror image. Uh, this is a very interesting thing in crystallography, where there are tartaric acid crystals of both forms, which indicates the existence of the fourth dimension. I'd like to close with a quotation from Robert Oppenheimer on nuclear authority. This leads us toward the metaphysical, which we'll be speaking of next week. The recent wonderful discovery that fundamental particles of physics have a left and right handedness opens new continents of thought. Are some galaxies composed of antimatter particles that go the other way, as Alice described the objects in her looking glass? <laughs>